the stuff of Christmas, um, whether it be the crass commercialism that, is, that really is demanding our attentions all the time, or the more wholesome stuff like um, family gatherings or uh, um, caroling or candlelight services, all of that stuff is awesome. I lo- honestly, I even love the crass commercialism, to be quite honest with you. Uh, but there is a hidden gem that is in the midst of all that is Christmas that often gets overlooked, and it's the most important thing of Christmas. And that is the fact that the creator of the universe, stop and think about this for just a second. The creator of the universe made the decision that he was going to leave his throne in heaven, come down to earth to become one of us. Now, If you stop and you just think about that objectively, you should be asking, why would he do that? There are two reasons, really. The first reason, the most important reason, is because that's the plan. That was the plan. The plan was for our holy and perfect God to come to earth, to become a human being, to die on the cross and rise again on the third day to offer salvation. That was the plan, to offer salvation to whoever would receive it to bring salvation to the world. But that leads us to the second reason why he came. The fact that he is holy and perfect. Many human beings, because God, because we know, we just inside of us, just in our very essence, we understand that God is holy and perfect and just. And knowing that God is holy and perfect and just, it it causes us to wonder, how can a God like that really understand my life? understand me. I mean, think about it. I am the farthest thing from holy and perfect and just as there is. My, I'm broken. I'm sinful. I'm constantly tempted. And it causes me to wonder, even though that God is holy and perfect, how can He understand me and what I'm going through? Well, it says in Hebrews chapter 4, it says that, that God sent this holy priest, whose name is Jesus, that he became, he sent him to earth and he became one of us. And he was tempted in all ways that we are. Did you hear what I just said? That God, one of the reasons why God came to earth, why God sent Jesus to earth, was um, so that he might be tempted, even though he never sinned. That's what it says there in, in Hebrews uh, Chapter 4 says, though he never sinned, he um, understood. And because he understood, we can approach the throne of grace with confidence to find mercy. Because he understands. In other words, even though he didn't sin, he knows exactly what it feels like to be a human being. In fact, God went one step further to make sure that you understood that he understood exactly what it feels like to be a human being. In bringing his plan of salvation into existence, God made the decision that he was going to use sinful, broken human beings, just like you and me, to bring the plan into existence. In fact, I would go so far as to say that most of you would be absolutely shocked if you knew the story of the people's DNA that God used to bring Christmas into existence. Because that's what Christmas is, right? The celebration of God's gift of salvation. So you know what we're going to do the next few weeks? We're going to explore the DNA of Christmas. We're going to explore some of the stories uh, of the people that God used to bring Christmas into existence. And these stories are going to shock you. Of all the people that God could have used, of all the DNA that God could have used, it was the DNA of these people. Today we're going to start by exploring, by looking at the DNA or looking at the story of a person's DNA. It was a coward. You've probably all heard of a guy named Abraham, right? 
one of the most famous person in all the world, in all of history, actually. He's often referred to as Father Abraham. You want to know why he's referred to as Father Abraham? It's because he's the father of three of the world's most historical and prominent religions. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. His DNA can be traced back to all three. And you're hearing that, you're, you're hearing that fact, and you're thinking, man, this guy must be, he must be a saint or something, right? He must be a paragon of virtue. He must, if there was a man of God, it had to be Abraham. Kind of. Let me tell you Abraham's story. It's true, Abraham, actually, before he became um, a man of faith, which he was, he was known as Abram. And one day God, the creator of the universe, spoke to Abram and he says, Abram, I have chosen you. And I want you to leave everyone you know and everything you know, and I want you to come follow me because i got a plan. And it was by faith that Abram chose to follow God. But it took more than just faith for Abram to follow God because where God was leading him was into a, a very wild and untamed land and it was scary. So he had to be courageous too. And the people, some of the people that they would meet along the way as they went on this journey would be fearsome. Abraham was not only faithful, but he was courageous. Some of the time. You see, Abraham was a broken and sinful human being just like you and me. And as the story goes, it says that as they were uh, faithfully and courageously following God, because God had a plan, it says that as they were going into this kind of wild and untamed land, into these, this land of these fearsome warriors, they came to the land of Egypt. And in the land of Egypt, uh, Abram looked around and he saw these Egyptians and, and, he, and he realized how powerful they, that they were and he became frightened because the Egyptians were so strong and powerful and, and he thought, you know what? These strong and powerful warriors are going are gonna to see um, all that I have and, and they're going to want to kill me and take what I have for themselves. So it was in the midst of his fear that he hatched a plan. And he looks over and he sees his wife, Sarai, who would become Sarah after she had faith too. And he goes, that's the plan. So it says in Genesis chapter 12, verse 12, that Abram comes to Sarai and he says, Sarai, this is what we're going to do. As we come into the land of Egypt, they're going to see that you're beautiful. And when they see that you're beautiful, I want you to tell them, don't tell them that you're my wife. Tell them that you're my sister. Because once they realize that you're my sister, they won't feel like they need to kill me because they can just have you. That's quite a plan, isn't it? Lisa, what do you think about that plan, babe? <laughs> Abram was a coward. Unless you think it was just a momentary uh, lapse of cowardice, guess what? Genesis chapter, that happened in Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 20, he does it again. Abram is a cowardice, sinful, broken human being. Now, I know what y'all are thinking. You're thinking, Pastor, none of this sounds very Christmassy. And you're right, it doesn't sound very Christmassy, does it? <laughs> but stay with me for just a second, because I'm not done. You haven't heard the whole story. I'm, I'm wondering if you've put all the pieces together. Because if you were paying attention, you would have noticed. Let me tell you another part of the story. In Genesis chapter 20, you know what God said to Abram? 
He said, Abram, because of your faith, I'm going to make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. I'm going to make out of your descendants, from your DNA, I'm going to make a great nation from which I will bring salvation to the world. Which we know is Jesus, right? Now, if you are listening closely, you will have noticed that I just said that happened in Genesis chapter 20, right? Where at, or 20, that happened in 22. If you notice, his cowardice occurred in Genesis chapter 12 and verse in, in chapter 20. In other words, God knew before he made the promise that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. Out of your descendants, I will make a great nation. And from your descendants, from your DNA, I will bring salvation to the world. God already knew that he was a coward. You see what I'm saying? And he promised him anyway. You know why? Because God loved him. And here is the difference that often exists between God and human beings. We human beings have a tendency to make our love conditional. Not God. Even though he knows we are messed up, cowardice, Sinful human beings. He looks at you and he thinks, man, I love them. I love you. It's unconditional. Most human beings live their lives in fear of the possibility you see, it's true that God is perfect and holy and just. We, and we know that there is a great chasm between this perfect, holy, and just God and us. We understand that. And that's what I was getting at. We, we live our lives often daily. We live our lives in fear of the possibility that people will be able someday find out who we really are. Every one of you do it. I know you do. And you're afraid because you think if people really knew me and the way I think and the way I act, they'd walk away in disgust. And if that's what people would do, how much more would it be? How much more would God want to do that, right? Well, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. God knows. He knows the mess that you are the brokenness that exists within you. He knows the things that you think, and he loves you anyway. <laughs> that is one of the most beautiful and profound and frightening thoughts I have ever had. That he knows the innermost me, and he loves me anyway. He knows the innermost you, and he loves you anyway. It is true. Our God is perfect and holy and just. But you want to know what else is true? He is merciful and loving and gracious. And the proof is Christmas. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, there, there's a part of me as I'm sitting and pondering the truth, that truth. I, I feel almost blinded by its reality, the glare of the reality of that truth, the beauty of it, and I feel so exposed yet so loved at the same time. And that's what Christmas is supposed to, to be. We can get caught up in the 
commercialism and all the other things that are beautiful about Christmas. But if we forget that, if we don't ever come to grips with that, we miss the whole point. So that's my prayer for all of us in these next few weeks as we lead up to Christmas. My prayer is that we will just choose to bask in the beauty and the brightness of your unconditional love. Knowing that you know us and you love us in spite of ourselves. And I guess I just want to say thank you for, for that. In Jesus' name, amen.